morning, Faith Community Church. We are so glad that you are here today to worship with us. I want to um, just introduce myself. My name is Jean Allen, and I actually lead worship down at the State Line campus most weekends. But since Josh is taking some well-deserved time off, it's my privilege to be here with you today, worshiping. So I wanted to start, oh, and I wanted to welcome the people who are online. I'm sorry, I forgot you, but you are never forgotten. You are equally a part of our gathering, all right? So we are here together as one family to worship our God. So why don't you stand on your feet? One, two, ready, and. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. He has done so many great things. And we think of those things right now. He has forgiven us. He has adopted us as his children. He has guaranteed eternity with us forever. And he is victorious over death and life. Our God has indeed done great things. Amen? Amen. All right. So today we want to remember together what our God has done to worship him, bow at his feet, and sing the glory of his name. So would you sing with us of the great things that he has done?
such great things for us. But the challenge is to remember those great things when times get tough and life gets hard. Because it does for all of us. We all walk through seasons where it's not all sunshine and roses. In those times, we have to remember what God has done for us in the past. Because those times will fuel our expectation of what He will do in the future. And that's why I think it's so important to gather as a family of believers that we can remind each other of these truths. We can sing of what is true, what is praiseworthy, and what is good. So you're not just here for yourself this morning.
of taking one block on top of another, his building blocks of love and trust and faithfulness. And we can sing, worthy are you, Lord God. I will put my trust in you. I will build my life upon you because there is no surer foundation than you. So let's sing together of the worthiness of Jesus' name. There's no name that we could sing that is more worthy of all of our praise. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could
lift our voices to you, God. I see them almost like incense rising to you. I know that our worship and our praise is sweet to your ear. It's an acceptable sacrifice. wait for the greater things that are yet in store because you are a great God and to you belongs all honor and glory and majesty and worship and praise we pray all of this in the name of your powerful and precious son but if you would like to just take a moment and greet the people around you in whatever way that you sort of feel safe doing, if you want to just wave, if you want to give a handshake or a hug, let's greet each other. Amen. Hey church family, I'm Pastor Logan and here are your announcements for this week. If this is one of your first times joining us here at Faith Community Church, whether in person or online, we would love to be able to just connect with you. And I want to tell you real quick about something a little strange that we like to do here, but it's all just to say we are so glad that you're here. In the seat back pocket in front of you or if you're watching online attached to this video, we have something that is called a connection card. And if you take about 30 seconds to fill that connection card out, we would love to be able to give you a gift. Now, if you submit it online, we would love to be able to deliver these or ship one to your house. And if you submit it in person, you can bring it to the Welcome Center. And our gift is not that big of a deal. It's just our faith community coffee mugs. Coming up next Sunday, August 8th at 11.30 a.m., in the classroom as well as we have an online option so that's in Janesville in the classroom or if you are attending our state line campus or our online campus we have an online option for our GPS class GPS stands for gifts passion and service and it is a way for us together as one team to look at our gifts our passions and how we might want to serve and make a difference so if you are looking to get connected on a team here at Faith Community Church, we would love to have you attend GPS class. Again, that's next Sunday, August 8th at 11.30 a.m., either online or in the classroom in Jamesville. Coming up for August, our Faith in Action Ministry of the Month is Acts of Kindness. We at Faith have been supporting Acts of Kindness since 2008, and this local ministry reaches out to meet tangible needs in our community totally free of charge for those who need assistance. They are largely supported by the generous help of contributions from people like you, and we are asking that you help them out for the month of our August outreach. Please consider how you might be able to serve this vital ministry through your time, talents, donations, or financial support. Current needs include a grant writer, they need a new air conditioner, removal of a sink and a toilet, replace deteriorated wood on their soffit and fascia, and there are many projects that could be done, like painting, plumbing for outdoor water spigots, etc. but this is what they are hoping to accomplish for now. If you are able to help complete one or more of the following tasks, or if you would be willing to help on a service project, please contact Laura Bergeron, our Director of Outreach here at our Janesville campus at laura at faithjanesville.org or call AOK -okay at 608-728-0841. 
All right, everybody, that's it for announcements this week. We're so thankful that you're here at church with us, and we'll see you again next week. Awesome. Thank you, Pastor Logan, uh, for everything you do. Slight correction, GPS is not at 1030. It is at 1130. Just a heads up to everyone. So good morning, everyone. Um, good morning to our online campus watching. We are sincerely very happy everyone is here. It is abundantly clear that Pastor Jeff is not here today. Um, this weekend is going to be a little different. Um, some people are looking a little confused. It's no, Jeff did not just get 25 years younger and more handsome. <laughs> he did, however, need some very well-deserved time off. So he has asked Pastor Gary and I to, to preach this weekend for my fellow bargain shoppers, those who love to get the buy one, get one deal. You are not getting one, but you are getting two sermons this weekend. It is super exciting. Um, <laughs> So there's two topics. We, we've been in Hebrews for quite some time, and we're coming to a close. This is the final chapter of Hebrews, and throughout all of Hebrews, we see all these, these remarkable reminders, these powerful truths of the identity of Christ. He is our high priest. He is God. He is worthy of our praise and, and our adoration, right? So then in chapter 13, we see this series of expectations that really wrap it up and remind us about all of those. Now, what's very important is within today, we're going to have these two big topics we're going to hit on. Gary got the easy one because he has to teach on sexual immorality. <laughs> he, he got, the, he got the, the underhanded pitch. I got the tough one because I have to teach on how to be nice to people. <laughs> and we laugh, but there's something really heavy in this today. We're going to start in Hebrews 13, verses 1 through 3, and we're going to walk through that as kind of our foundational scripture for this first part. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. Now, what's important here to note is the term zania, which we're going to get into in a little bit. We're going to talk on that in a lot more depth here in a moment, but the topic is hospitality. Now, what do we think of when we think hospitality, right? We, we think Chick-fil-A, right? The line's like 400 yards long. They get you from the back to the front in like 12 seconds. Somehow you say, thank you. They say what? They say, my pleasure. And then they give you a half gallon of Chick-fil-A sauce just because. That's like our view of hospitality. You just get a little plus one. You get a little bit of extra. Now, this term zenia, it is a Koine Greek term. And what it means, it means guest friendship. And it's more of a concept instead of just a little thing you do. It's this way of approaching life in general. Um, another really powerful kind of definition is to give of oneself until you have nothing left to give. Right? So why is that important? If we look when Hebrews 13 was written, it was lightly, likely written around 60 AD. What was going on in 60 AD was the building up to the height of persecution of the Christian church across all of, all of history. Um, and it continued to continually get worse and worse. And then around 66 AD, it hit its pinnacle during the Jewish-Roman wars. Now, just to paint a little bit of a picture, yes, we have it bad. Life is hard. At that point, the Roman Empire was taking homes away from Christians. It was taking family members, dragging them out, and torturing men, women, and young children slowly to death. Children, mind you, for the God that we serve. So when we think that in spite of this, in spite of this, this rampant homelessness and, and persecution and, and starvation and death, but in spite of this, the author of Hebrews, it was Paul, <clears throat> excuse me, um, he still stresses the importance of zenia. He still stresses that of this brotherly hospitality to one another. And he, he still stresses for that care of, of those in need. And there are so many humbling examples. We can look through all of scripture of where there's hospitality and that kind of love. One really stands out to me I love. Um, it's from Acts 16. And we're going to read that because there are two really strong ones here. Um, let's go ahead and read that. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. 
When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and he was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, do not harm yourself for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. So strong, so powerful. And those two examples of that zinnia, that hospitality, the first one is very subtle. And we kind of miss that. What were Paul and Silas doing? They had nothing. They were imprisoned. The Roman prison they were in was, at the time, by far the most deplorable and horrible of prisons on the planet. Prisoners were already abused in ways that were unimaginable. Christians more so, not just by the guards, but also by their fellow prisoners. So what's powerful there is Paul and Silas, they have nothing. They're likely sick, definitely starving, filthy. And what did they have to offer? They offered the praises of God and the truth of the gospel to those around them. And we saw what happened there, right? And this, the spirit moved, something happened. God performed yet another of his miracles and shook the very foundations of an entire prison, forced the doors open. And what's important here in this next part is we see this guard. He was not just like, you know, you think of like, like cartoons, you got this goofy looking guy, he's got like a little dagger, ha ha ha. No, this would have been a centurion, a very high ranking military official. These were not just two normal prisoners and Christians. These were two what would have been considered terrorists and two very high profile enemies to the state of Rome. So we look and say he was about to kill himself and says he was, he was, likely fearful. A lot of people think he was fearful of what the Roman Empire, that punishment that was going to come on him, but that's not the case. So as a high-ranking official in the Roman Empire, he would have been under an oath called the sacramentum. It is a sacred oath. And what that is, is it's, it's this oath that any religious leaders, any military leaders or Roman officials would swear before the Roman gods and before Caesar is God, that above all else, they would serve the country of Rome, the empire of Rome, to their fullest and to their death. So when you're sitting there as this high-ranking official and you think, holy, oh my gosh, no, I just let the two most high-profile prisoners in the entirety of empire of Rome escape, it was not that he was afraid of what was going to happen to him. He pulled his sword out to kill himself because he had failed Rome. Now, why am I bringing that up? Because that paints the picture of him. He was an enemy of God. Just to be pull, just completely blunt, he was an enemy to Christendom. He was likely involved in the killing and torture of children and prisoners. And then what happened? What did Paul and Silas do? They preached the gospel, the truth. And just like that, he just, boom, this immediate regeneration and transition. And suddenly everything changes because what happens next is that second incredible example of hospitality. What did he do? As soon as he became a Christian, as soon as he was baptized in God, hospitality, zinnia. He clothed them. He fed them. He healed them and cleaned their wounds. Literally an hour ago, he wouldn't have cared if they burned to death. And now, what's he doing? He's taking care of them, the least of these. Why is that important? Is because not only an hour ago, Of course, he was this high-ranking official in Rome. But now, as an enemy of Rome, he fully understands that he is now an enemy of Rome. He switched sides. And the fullest punishment that's been on all these Christians that he personally was likely visiting upon them is now likely going to come for not just him, but his family. But that's the power of the gospel, isn't it? We change. Our priorities change. That hospitality is now given to to our fellow brothers and sisters. And that's just so humbling, isn't it, to to go that far? And I don't know about anyone else here, but that's really convicting. 
um, unless I am totally insane, which is very highly likely, the world is still fallen, right? <laughs> Pandemics, illness, uh, there's people in destitution, divorce, death, anything, homelessness, you name it, it is happening still just like it did. Not much has changed. It is still happening. In a few thousand years, but at the same time, there are these amazing opportunities before us to be very Christ-centered in our love to others and to serve others. Well, I, I don't know. I'm not called. That's not my spiritual gift. Yes, I totally just stole one of Jeff's silly voices. I am unapologetic about it. My response to that is this, that we're not called. It's not our responsibility. If you look at how the first three verses of Hebrews are written, it is not a suggestion, is it? It's a command. It's point blank. Do this. People need this, right? And we're, we've got a really cool example of that in Matthew 25, right? Um, 25 verse 34, then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, you did it to me. The king. I'll give you three guesses who that is, but you're only going to need one. That's Jesus. That is God. He makes it very clear as fully God, doesn't he? And, you know, he's not that big of a deal, right? He's, he's just the creator of all things, totally omnipotent and sovereign over all eternity from before time. It's, you know, not that big of a deal, right? Obviously, I'm being silly, but I really like how John describes him in his vision from the book of Revelation. And we're going to read that real quick to Revelation 19. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and he makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are the many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty." On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's my Jesus. That's our God. And what did he do with that sovereignty, with that omnipotence, all that power, commanding the, the armies of heaven? He came. You know what he did with all that power? He came to this earth and he washed feet. <laughs> he came to this world with all of his sovereignty and he fed the hungry. He healed the sick. He befriended the enemy. He brought the truth of the gospel that dead men can be made alive. And to really just top it off, he died on a cross, forever sealing his children unto himself and completely and eternally promised it, fulfilling it with three words. It is finished. That's also my Jesus. That is also our God. He used all that power to do marvelous and wonderful things, yes, but he also did it and used it for the mundane. And we often think maybe the mundane, is, it's not that big of a deal, but in his case, he showed that it was. And we also see something else that's really, really profound to me is there's this constant theme of Christ greeting people. If, if we were to go through all the different scriptures where he did that, we'd be here till like four o'clock. But we don't really need to. It's, it's constant. He greets people, greets what would have been enemies, greets the tax collectors and the, the sinful, horrible, lost people, right? He was greeting us. Now, this is totally going to be a shame, shameless plug at the ministry I get to oversee. 
Um, but the assimilation and welcome ministry, right? What do we see? Every time you come into faith, what do you see? Door open, somebody smiling, smile, hey, welcome, welcome to faith. Good morning, how are you? Good evening. Right? We look at it, it's, it's so simple, it's so mundane, and a lot of times we look at just somebody smiling, saying hello, and saying, oh, you know, they're just, hey, 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 Frank, how's it going? No. We are very sincere. We are happy to have you here. We are here because we want you not to just fill and put your butts in the seats and give us money. That's not how faith community church works. We are here because we sincerely are joyous to have you worshiping God with us, to be side by side with you through those hard times through your struggles and knowing it's a privilege to get to do so, to give you Zania. Now, I'm going to ask for participation, and I'm going to start wrapping it up so Gary can come up here and transition. Everyone close your eyes. We're going to, we're going to make a visualization of a scenario like that. So just kind of just walk through this with me. You're, you're downtown, some big city. You hear lots of people, lots of footsteps are going about their lives. You smell a little bit of exhaust from a car. You hear a siren, an ambulance in the background. You got giant big screens, those, those LED billboards showing ads and playing music and just all this noise, all this stuff. And you see on this corner, there's a little beat up old Chevy woman who looks exhausted. She's got a baby who's screaming, who looks sick. Got two little ones that are at her knees, who they're fighting and arguing as siblings will do, and she's in a rush, she's hurried, she's stressed, she starts walking away, and you notice she left her keys, she, she dropped her keys. You go grab those keys, you run up to her, man, man, I've got your keys, you dropped your keys. And she says, thank you. She says, thank you. And you have two choices. You can say, you're welcome and go about your life. Or you can say, I notice you look very tired and stressed. I just want to let you know that the God of creation loves you. Okay, open your eyes. So simple, right? Four seconds is all it would have taken to do that. And that mundane thing that, that, hey, I want to help you, but I also want to give you the truth of God could have an eternal impact. That could be the worst day of her life could have just been made the best day of her life because that simple thing could have been the turning point in the transition where the gospel is amongst her. She's amongst that and amongst us with God. That simple thing. Because, you know, at the end of life, is our 401k going to matter? <laughs> the size of that 401k, it's not going to matter, right? But what will matter is how you treated God's children and what you did for them and what you led them to. Now, show of hands as I'm going to finalize this real quick. I need a little bit more participation. Who here right now knows somebody who is going through something very difficult? right? Almost every hand, if not every hand goes up. Who here right now has been through something difficult, right? Every hand goes up. Who here right now is going through something very hard? Right this second. Almost every single hand went up. We've got a lot of work to do. And we should do so joyfully knowing what that impact could be to them. Think on that. And we're going to transition. I'm going to hand you off to Gary now, and he's going to do uh, the easy one. Try not to fall asleep. <laughs> okay, he picked on me, so did you notice he had a little something here the whole time? He was pre <laughs> uh, I love hospitality. Um, and, you know, I really have to talk to Jeff about these preaching assignments because um, he gets hospitality and I get sexual immorality. <laughs> but I, I want to make a comment about hospitality because, you know, this, this is a God thing. The exact hospitality he is talking about, I saw at the campground where, where Eric and I were at with this couple named Caesar and Anna. Now, I remember when we went to look at this trailer and to buy it, I looked over that one area, and I'm like, uh-oh, that could be the party crowd that stays up at night and gets noisy. Well, no, it turned out that was where Caesar and Anna were, who are believers. And they invite everybody at Black Hawk Grand Campground for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They offer that hospitality. They've been there a year, 
And, they, and God has used them to see seven people come to Christ. So now when Eric and I bought this trailer, it was to have a peaceful hideaway and get away from things. So of course, Eve, after meeting Caesar and Anna, we're, we're in. All right, next week, we're going to bring the, the, the sausage and bacon. Now my wife, I keep saying sausage and bacon, and my wife keeps saying breakfast meats. Am I missing something here? I'm not sure, but, uh, you know, any chance I get to, to put bacon in the mix is a good thing. Um, so, okay, so we're going we're gonna to move from hospitality, which we are all called to do, to talk about marriage and sexual immorality. See, because remember now, Paul, sorry, the author, I think it's Paul as well, I agree with Jeff and Jesse, that's okay, it doesn't matter. But the author is talking to an audience who is under heavy persecution. And his desire is a pastoral letter to speak to all the things they need to watch for and, and continue to do. And one of them is hospitality. And the other, as it says in, in verse 4, the first section, verse A, marriage should be honored by all. Now, I have a lot of people I know that say, well, marriage is just a piece of paper. We don't need to be married. Where does it say that in the Bible? There it is. Marriage should be honored by all. And there's a reason he's teaching this, because if you look at that period, marriage was not honored. That sounds familiar. Uh, most of you know I am like a super nerd, and I'm reading the Roman historian Suetonius right now. Everybody goes, oh, yeah, I've read that book, sure. <laughs> okay? But he, his book is about the 12 Caesars. And I'm just focusing on the first one, Julius Caesar, and I lost count of how many times he got married and divorced. for convenience sake, or for political sake, or because he wanted this woman. You know, it's interesting how nothing's new under the sun. Nothing has changed, except the word stays unchangeable. Marriage should be honored by all. God himself established marriage in Genesis 2.24. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. And Jesus repeats this idea in Mark chapter 10, verses 6 through 9. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh, a team. So they are no longer two, but one flesh, a team. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. But like Jesse, I'll mention, maybe you could call me crazy, but we're, we live in a fallen world, am I right? And things are, going to be, things are going to happen. First of all, what I talk about during this time, I want you to understand, I understand abuse in marriage. I'm not talking about that. If you're abused, you need to get out, and you need to let us minister to you. Okay? What we're talking about is we're trying to focus on what keeps us away from a godly marriage. And it says in first, verse 4b, all right, it said it continued, started with marriage should be honored by all. But then it says, and the marriage bed kept pure, pure, for God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. Okay, I don't need to talk about what God's judgment is. I think we all know that. So one thing we know, don't do adultery, don't do sexual immorality. God will judge. But once again, we're in a fallen world. And, and even when it says in Exodus 20, 14, you shall not commit adultery, 
It happens. Uh, and my friends, it happens in the Christian community too. We need to be clear about that. Why? Because we're sinners saved by grace. Anybody here perfect? I'm putting my hand down in case a lightning strike will come. All right? So we need to talk about this. We, we don't need to ignore it. We need to talk about it. So let's talk about adultery. All right, now you remember I used to be in politics, and I was in politics in the 90s when adultery was being talked about a lot, and all these talking heads, like myself, would sit there and parse, well, what do you mean by adultery? You know, that depends on what your definition of is is. Uh, You know, and and here's, let me just be quite frank. You can spin all you want, and I know because I know how to do spin. But here's one common rule. If you want to know what adultery is, ask your spouse. Because he or she will be glad to tell you. And uh, it's something that's become too prevalent for a lot of reasons, and we'll talk about that. But, you know, when we think of adultery, I could sit here and tell you, don't do it. All right, now go off and don't do it. Or, this is what I love about faith community. If you're struggling with it, hey, we have people who've been there who can help lead you out to freedom from that. If you're struggling with pornography, which, by the way, is emotional emotional adultery, or if you're struggling with sex outside of marriage and it's become like an addiction that you can't overcome, we have a ministry called Sealed. For men in that position. Why? Because, doggone, I'm telling you right now, everybody is redeemable. Everybody. And so we should be there to help them walk to freedom. And by the way, we also have a ministry called Healed for the Spouses. Because here's the thing with adultery it wounds a lot of people, it destroys the marriage, it destroys the kids. It destroys another family. It is, it is a sin that leads to nothing but destruction. And I say that not as a condemnation, but because it breaks my heart to see families fall apart. Because I counsel some of those now adults who were children who were a part of that destruction. And no matter what people say, Kids are not resilient. And we need to remember that. But at the same time, we want to help you. Everybody is redeemable. So we could talk about that act of adultery, the physical act. We could also talk about emotional adultery. You know, my spouse just doesn't understand me. And you know what? Good chance you're right. Right? But, but then I met this friend of the opposite sex, and, and, and they really understand me, I get me. And we haven't even gotten to any physical action. Already, you've taken away the intimacy that should be between husband and wife. All right? um, as of Tuesday, my wife and I have been married 36 years. The finest three years of her life. <laughs> By the way, if you ask her, how, do you train a, how long does it take to train a husband? She will say 36 years and counting. <laughs> but she is my partner, my helpmate, the person I can share anything with and not get condemnation. You know, studies have shown that spouses who have a spouse that they know that person has their back in every way, they exponentially grow in their confidence, their competence, and there's even a physical chemical reaction that happens in them. 
that is good and healthy. See, because marriage is about teamwork. If you have a spouse who doesn't understand, see, this is where I love faith. We can help you. We have a marriage mentoring ministry to learn that. To, to become better understanding of how to communicate. Communication, that's a big one. By the way, um, 36 years with my beautiful, wonderful wife was not 36 years of bliss. But we didn't give up. We fought it out together to get where we are now. And that means forbearance. You guys know me. You know she had to have a lot of forbearance. All right? It means self-sacrifice. You know, we, we went uh, every year when we were at, at our home church in New Jersey, we went to this marriage weekend, and Dr. Stephen Treat used to talk about how if you, spouse, focus on meeting the needs of him, this spouse, and this spouse focus on the needs of this spouse, what do you think happens? People get their needs met. But it requires self-sacrifice. And men, yeah, it's coming up. All right, many of you know who've counseled with me. I am a royal pain to the husbands. There's even a group that gets together and goes, we know you think Pastor Gary's nuts, but listen to him. All right, and why is that? Because in Ephesians 5, men always love to point to, wives, submit to your husbands. Because he's the head. Well, now this is the wise where you can sharpen your elbow. Because I want the husbands to think, to understand something. It also says, husband, love the wife like Christ. Love the church. See, it's not about power in the household. It's about self-sacrifice. Guys, you've got to give it up. Every decision you make as the supposed head should be focused on, am I blessing my spouse and I'm blessing my children? No matter what it means for you, give it up. It's pure and simple. It's just that simple. And, and, and wives, he needs your help. Instead of spiral, let's communicate. And if that isn't happening, well, welcome to the club. We've all been through it. And we'll help you with that through marriage mentoring. But uh, I'm always going to place the onus on you guys first. By the way, wives... That doesn't mean you're going to get away with anything. <laughs> All right? But that's okay. As long as you desire to be a team. You've got to have somebody who has your back. And that should be your spouse. Then you don't go elsewhere for what your needs are. And we can help you with that. You know, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. Oh, yeah. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out that you can endure it. And here's one of those guides right here. Now, this is not a rule book. This is an instruction guide, just so you know for our own sake. But have you noticed how we might want to ignore a few passages? Oh, I don't want to do that. No, it's just me. So uh, I also want to show you a great book, Sacred Marriage by Gary Thomas, that brings up the scriptures you, we might want to ignore. See, because what Gary is teaching is that marriage is about holiness. Not happiness. It's about holiness because holiness brings joy. All right, I know there's preachers out there that say, God wants you to be happy. 
Now, just so you know, if you hear that from a, a, a preacher, you have my permission to kick them in the shins. All right, because Jesus makes it quite clear we're going to have trials and tribulations. And that's where when you work as a team, those trial and tribulations, you will also have joy. You guys know about four months ago, we lost a grandson. And there's two things that bring me joy. It's a spouse who's there for me and I'm there for her. And that we know we're going to see our grandson again. See, it's not about happiness. It's about holiness. And we want to be there with you. Because it, you have the Bible to go to and you have a community to go to. See, that's what I love about faith. We don't condemn. We go, you know what? Some of us have been there. Let us help you walk out of that to freedom. Because that's what it's about. I mean, if you're here and you think you're perfect, everybody get away from that person because lightning's going to strike. But if you're here and you know you're broken, well, welcome to the club. So now let's find freedom and joy, even in the hard times. We are a family. So let's break down the barriers and admit when we're struggling, and let's do something about it, including closing in prayer. Lord, you're in control. And I don't know about others, but I don't always like that, but um, that's just the way it is. Um, and you have, you've given us an instruction guide that is so helpful for us. Let us help to build each other's marriages as a family, as a group. And for those who are struggling, to find the help they need so that they become, become a team. You, you tell us about in Ecclesiastes, the cord of three strands are never broken. Husband, wife, and Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we just lift ourselves to you and give thanks that even in our brokenness, you love us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so much. For those who uh, want to give tithes and offerings, there's boxes in the back. For the people online, there's also online giving. Thank you for everybody who's watching elsewhere. We love you. It is so great to have a worldwide community and still be one. Have a blessed day.